Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Shades of Entrepreneurship. This is your host, Mr. Gabriel Flores. Today, I am here with Toby Burns from DJ to CEO. But before we get into all that, Toby, welcome to the show. How are you doing? I'm very good. Thanks for having me. Excited to uh, have a little chit chat today. Having a little chit chat. So you got a bit of an accent, Toby. So be before we get into the career move, could you please introduce yourself, share a little bit about your education, background, career, career journey, give us some of your personal experience and how you got on the entrepreneurial path. So it's great. This, how long have we got? Yeah, um, we're opening it up, right? Right from the So, get. yeah, I mean, I was, um, I'm from a little seaside town in uh, Essex in the United Kingdom. And yeah, love living by the sea. I'm a, I'm a sea baby. And through my career and, and even growing up, I always wanted to be making money, entrepreneur. And I, I had a really tough time at school. Um, and I've talked about this before, like, you know, quite badly bullied, moved a lot of schools over a period of time. And then I, I found somewhere where I settled. And it was more the mindset of like, I want to prove uh, these bullies wrong. And I'm going to really do something um, quite special. So from a very young age, before the DJ, I was a children's entertainer. Some people call that clown. I don't like, <laughs> I don't like to use that term, but a children's Truth entertainer. Comes out. So uh, at 15, 15 years old, I had a man in a van pick me up from school, pick me up from college at, the, you know, three o'clock. Everyone's going out, playing football. I was straight to a a party and I was entertaining children, um, entertaining teenagers, school discos, children's entertainment. And it got to a point where I was doing sort of like 10 kids parties a week oh, wow. and children's parties, you know, people spend a lot on a party. Um, I'm just going through it at the moment with my own daughter. So I know people <laughs> spend uh, a lot of money on parties, but we would, I was doing about 10 a week. So six over a weekend, four during the week. And I thought, there was one point where I like I broke my wrist and I was like, oh, you know, you it's it's a profitable job. If you're not going out, you're not earning money. So I quickly transitioned into DJing and and the sort of DJing I did was uh Jewish, Arab, and corporate events. That was my market. So I wasn't doing 18th or 21st, it was very specific bar bat mitzvahs, um, Arabic sort of weddings and corporate. So for the likes of Google, and we still do Google today. I still DJ for them three times a year. Virgin, uh, Virgin Airways, Brit British, um, British Airways. So big corporate companies. And I was in the US at the time. So I don't know where you are based exactly. Where are you based? Beautiful Portland, Oregon. Oh, beautiful. Oh, Okay. Beautiful, right above California. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I was in the US and I saw this silent disco and I was standing there and I was like, what the hell is this? This is crazy. And I just thought, one, I could do it better. Two, we can use better <laughs> headphones that look better, that are more premium. And I knew that the market that I was DJing with would love it. So we bought 200 headphones. My parents thought I was mad. Um, you know, I'd saved up through children's entertaining. We developed this headphone in the Far East, brought in 200. Um, and then, yeah, within a week, two weeks, they were fully booked for the next three months. So we went again, we bought more, we bought more and just reinvested constantly to today where we now stand at uh, over 15,000 headphones in the UK. We have, um, we opened up in Dubai in, in 2023. Um, so we have a certain amount out there as well. And now we have a, a big team and I'm involved in a few other businesses, property, and we've really used the profits of the business to build moats around our business and give us security that, um, you know, God forbid another COVID happens. We have security around us um, that will make sure that we more than survive those tough times so that's a little 10 year 15 year in uh 
period in a, in a few minutes. In a few minutes, in a little nutshell there now. Now for the folks, for the folks that may be unaware of what the silent, so again, you, you mentioned you're the founder and CEO of the Silent Disco Company. Explain what that is. What what does a silent disco do? A silent disco, and it, it's really funny you say that because after 10 years of doing this, I still go to events and people go, I've never seen this before, which like is mind boggling for me. But a silent disco is a bit like we're, what we're doing now. Everyone has a pair of headphones. There's no fancy wires. They're all wireless. Um, and on the headphone, there's a little switch. And you can have multiple channels of music that everyone can listen to. So people can choose what they want to listen to. Let's say you have three DJs, you one DJ, you don't, and not everyone wants to listen to what the DJ is playing. So the, the guests can choose what they want to listen to. Um, and that just gives a whole different feel of entertainment. So that's what we do. And we do dry hire, which is where you're having a house party. You can plug in three phones and have three channels of music, you know, uh, your oldest music, your, your kids music and rock and roll in the middle. Um, and people can choose what they want to listen to. So we do that. Uh, we provide event packages. So with DJs and lighting. So we do a, a turnkey solution there. And then uh, over the years with the, the brand, we have lots of sub brands. So the cinema hire company, we do the big drive in cinemas, uh, outdoor cinemas. We do that as a dry hire. So people can do that in their garden. Or you can have a big screen for a drive-in cinema. It's really popular in the US as well. Um, and then we do, most recently, the karaoke hire company. So the same concept. Our model is, you know, majority. It goes in a box. It turns up at your front door. You have an amazing weekend having a silent disco with your friends. And then it gets collected on a Monday. So that's the model. And everything that we try and do with cinema, karaoke, it all fits into that model. It goes in a box. We ship it to you. We ship it back. You have an amazing time. And it's super easy. And this is the thing we tell everyone, like, is it complicated? This is super, super easy. Even your nan can set it up. You plug in two things and away you go. you got a silent disco. You know, it's such it's such an interesting concept because I think folks, uh, I, I believe, in, you know, if you live in the United States, you probably have seen this before individuals with their headphones on uh, dancing in the club. However, I must admit, I never knew you can change through different music genres. Uh, if you didn't like something different, you can just listen to something else. Yeah, and, it, and it's like super easy switch on the headphone. So we do up to eight channels now on the headphone. Um and we do that for a lot of like corporate events. Like if you've got multiple areas and you want to listen to that keynote or that keynote, you can switch on the headphone between eight different keynotes that are going on. But the head, but the normal like party, yeah, you plug in three phones, three laptops. Um, it's as simple as that. And you, you choose as the user what you want to listen to. Now let's let's take a step back because you mentioned you know you're starting out as being a, a children's entertainer right a children's entertainer and you you did that for some years and then you pivoted into the dj and then you pivoted into the silent disco but let's talk about the first pivot into the dj area why why let's talk about that kind of transition why did you kind of begin i know you mentioned you 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 uh, had an injury that kind of forced you into that but why dj i think it's a natural progression i think a lot of children's entertainers you know uh, for example at a weekend uh, I would do an 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. party, uh, five, six, seven-year-olds party. Then I'd do a three till five uh, p.m. and do another children's party. And then in the evening, ch children are going to sleep. So I would then go out and do, a at that time, um, a bar mitzvah or um, an 18th birthday. But I was in a very specific market where they spent a hell of a lot, not with us, but the overall production, you know, they might spend a hundred thousand dollars on a, on a, on a six sweet 16 party. And they're sort of the ones that I used to do. So it was a natural progression to sort of fill those evenings when children's parties were, you know, it's too late. Um, and I loved DJing, um, you know, just entertaining the crowd. Um, a lot, a lot, you know, a lot of DJs will do kids and adults and, and that sort of thing. 
So you're, you're DJing and then you transition, right? And as you mentioned, to this silent disco. And let's talk about building the brand. Uh, could you walk us through the strategies and efforts that you employ to build and establish the brand identity? How, how do you build a brand with purpose and the power of customer centricity? The brand is super important. I mean, like I had a personal brand at that time as a children's entertainer, you know, people knew my name, um, you know, and they'd remember it was a catchy name. Um, so the brand was super important. And it for me, brands need to say what they do on the tin, you know, and keep it simple. So the silent disco company, the cinema hire company, the karaoke hire company, they all say um, what we do on the tin. So, I mean, the brand built up really naturally as um, the leader in, in the UK, sort of we were first to market. There were a few others doing it on a, on a smaller scale, but we went really, really heavy um, on branding. My brother um, at the time was marketing director for a big um, online gambling company. So he had a lot of insight into marketing. He uh, worked with us even to this day, um, you know, uh, and, and he really, Google was our best friend, you know, and even today we spend tens of thousands of pounds on Google ads to build up that brand. But for me, brand is all about customer service, recommendation, reviews, and we work so hard. Uh, and that's my main focus is you get good reviews, you get recommendations, um, pictures or videos people send in. And very quickly, people know you are the expert in the field. And we say this about all the businesses, like now there's 30 people in the UK all doing silent disco, but we present ourselves as the experts. We're not going to compete on price. We, we are this price because we know we have the team here. We're not working out of a garage at home or something. We have a large commercial building, a big team that whenever you want to speak to us, we're there. And I think that helps build a really amazing brand and a trusted brand for consumers. You know, I think you brought up a great point. Like consistency is so important when creating a brand guideline. I just got off a call uh, before this one talking about a brand guideline and creating consistency around it and the importance of it. Because when you start to go into different communities and your brand isn't consistent across all markets, uh, the consumer is going to take note of that. Uh, and, and if you're inconsistent with your brand, then you're going to be, and they're going to generally assume that you are also inconsistent with your service, your quality, your value, right? So consistency with your brand is very important because, you know, it allows you like Toby, in fact, this is the next conversation I want to get into it. Branding allowed you to go from like the house parties to corporate events. So how did you like, where did you find uh, you know, when you're now you have your brand, you're starting to build your brand. You mentioned Google. Where else did you go to find clients, in particular, to break into the uh, industrial event kind of space? So, how we really launched it, um, as I alluded to early on, is I I was dealing with these um, high end clients, and the whole reason I thought of bringing it is because you have an hour for dinner in a wedding, right? People eat for an hour. But the kids, they eat in 10, 15 minutes. And then for the other 45 minutes, they're causing havoc because oh, they're bored. Hell. They're bored. <laughs> so the whole reason, really, the core reason why I brought it into the, especially the Jewish market is because the kids would eat in 10 minutes. And this was a perfect way to entertain them while the adults can carry on eating. There's no noise. They've got headphones on the kids and they can dance and have a great time. But like children's entertaining it's a snowball effect and i and i say this as i said recommendation reviews so we would do a party you've got 50 guests there okay you've got 50 people using headphones out of that party we need four other people to book us then the then out of those four another four now you've got 16 bookings and it's a snowball effect um and COVID, you know, sort of stopped that snowball and you've had to start that snowball again. Um, but certainly it's snowballed and snowballed. Google ads, as I said, you know, I'm a huge fan of Google ads, um, giving our money to to them. Um, but if there's a good return on investment, 
Um, and, you know, it's not always a good return on investment. And we talk a lot about average lifetime value of a customer. And some people have one wedding, and they never use you again, like a DJ is, is rubbish. Um, average lifetime value of a customer, because they should really only be getting married once, you never know, but it should be once where a silent disco, okay, they might be having a house party, they might be having a birthday, and everyone has a birthday every single year. Um, and, and people love to party, especially in the UK. I don't know if we have a bad reputation, um, but Brits love a party. Um, <laughs> we, we are a party nation, I would say. <laughs> Any excuse that, you know, we get a bit of nice weather here and people throw a party. Um, love it. Love it. Going so, to UK. Yeah. Uh, and and it's not very nice weather very often. So you, you have a bit of nice weather, right? We're going to throw a party. Um, so yeah, coming back to your point, I think it snowballed. And if you keep the consistency of great reviews, great customer service, and our operations manager now is so heavily focused on customer service, like it frustrates me sometimes. He's like, you know, we're going to do this. We're going to, and I was like, if that's what gets it over the line, if that's what keeps the customer happy and coming back every year, the grandma's 90th. And we have that, like we have 90th birthdays where they're hiring silent disco. So it's such a, a vast age group of from five years old to 90 years old, people enjoy it. And I just think, as you said, consistency, if you're consistent with all of those elements, one, you will help build a fantastic brand and you have customer loyalty um and i use like apple as an example you know you go in you can book an appointment you when you buy a new macbook you get a free training session for 30 minutes like they're consistent in terms of their customer service um and that helps create amazing brands yeah. You know, I think you brought up a great point when you're thinking about the lifetime value of a customer, you know, and understanding that uh, it, it, a funny story. I was, I was at a wedding or at a quinceanera and, you know, to your point, you know, DJs and photographers, uh, they tend to have a limited lifetime value of their customer because, you know, well, they're going to have one wedding like you mentioned, but the funniest thing happened. Uh, my buddy's wedding photographer is there 15 years later taking photos of his daughter's quinceanera. And he's like, hey, I remember you guys. And I was like, what? This is the craziest thing I've ever seen. I have never in my yeah. life 15 years later. But, uh, you know, it is interesting because to that point, creating good customer service uh, allowed that individual to come back and service them 15 years later, right? Uh, having a re remarkable uh, moment with uh, either a sales or a company or anybody like Apple, right? Uh, Nike is a big thing over here in the Pacific Northwest, right? They make people feel like an athlete. Uh, that's been their kind of, you know, slogan for some time. And, and it's true, you know, f individuals, they feel that, you know, I always talk about feel, uh, building a brand. It's it's not just about the brand, and but it's about what you feel like wearing that brand. How does the brand make you feel, right? Uh, what are their core, what are your kind of, um, your own personal uh, beliefs and how does the brand align with those personal beliefs? You know, and people really truly do look at that. Yeah. I mean, look, our, our vision has always been um, making memories through celebrations. And I tell our team this all the time that, um, you know, any party leaves a memory with somebody. Um, so we're all about creating you know, making memories through celebrations and a celebration can be a number of things. Um, and, you know, you touched upon the photographer 15 years later. And it's funny because it, I don't DJ that much anymore. I'm quite selective. You know, we, we run a lot of businesses, property now. Um, so my time is stretched, but I still do maybe one or two a month because I enjoy it. Um, and it keep, you know, keeps it fresh. And, and I literally, I had a call um, about a month ago from a client and, and she said, oh, it's this, uh, it's Jessica. And I was like, you know, I speak to so many people. And she went, you did my daughter's fifth birthday. Oh, wow. She's, get, she's getting married next year. Can you DJ? Oh, and wow. I was, like, <laughs> I was like, what? I was like, one, that makes me feel so old. Um, because I was like, crazy. No way. Um and two, I was like, okay, maybe, you know, 
let's have a conversation. Let's get get on a call and see how we can uh, create a party. So your story is exactly the same. That I'm like, and I'm like, how old is she? She's like 21. I was like, that's young to get married. She was like, oh, they're childhood sweethearts. And I was like, that makes me feel old. Because that must have been, you know, right at the start. Like, you know, <laughs> right at the start. Um, but she remembered me and, she, you know, she follows me on social media. She sees the work we do. Um, so that's a really interesting um, story, like like you mentioned, that people do come back. And there is a, a an average lifetime value. And I think what's super important about, you know, a DJ and I tell, I tell this to other entrepreneurs, like I'm doing a lot more keynotes and I'm really passionate about young entrepreneurs, especially schools, universities, where they don't really know what they want to do. They may have gone through a tough time. And I just, I like speaking at those sort of events because it gives a kid, you know, something to work towards. And I always say like DJing is a profitable job. If you're not DJing, you're not earning money. And it's really important that when when I I needed something that would work without me in it, you know, uh, a a, pro, a commercially profitable company that doesn't need me in it to work. And that's all down to the team. Um, and if you have a great management team, it's getting it ready to, to sell. And so another entrepreneur always told me, like, build a company to sell even if you have no intention of selling it, because that discipline makes you build something so much more valuable that if in five, 10 years time, I want to exit, it's ready to go with a management team. And it makes it so much more valuable um, to a buyer rather than a one man band. Because if you're buying that business, you know, you basically got a profitable job rather than a profitable company. I, I completely agree. And folks, this is why I think operations is so important. Stop starting with your operational um, kind of plan is so important because if, if you're just the person, if you're just the person and you're just coming in, getting uh, you know, they're, they're not, they're not buying you the employee they're, they're buying the operations and the profit revenue cycles. They're buying the company, you know? And yeah. so, uh, ensuring those things are, are are really tight is very, very important. Now, you know, entrepreneurship comes with its fair share of challenges. Could you share some of your significant hurdles you've encountered uh, and, and when starting out your own with starting out your own business? And then how did you overcome those uh, hurdles? Yeah, look, entrepreneurship is tough. Um, a lot of people, builders, you know, they, they work for a building company and then they're like, oh, I'm going to go do this on my own. And then you realize how tough it is. And I tell my team, like, when I get home, it's not a nine till five for me. And you get home and you switch off. As an entrepreneur, it's 24-7. Um, and even my wife, I, I say to her, like, I have, imagine your internet uh, and you're on Chrome or Safari. And, and it feels like for me, you've got 100 tabs open. And you're switching between all these different tabs, um, trying to trying to get stuff done. And I think entrepreneurship is really, really tough. It's nonstop. It's very lonely. There's no instruction manual of how to run a business. Like you have to work it out. Um, and someone that I watch a lot, Stephen Bartlett, he's like, the best way of learning is failing. If you fail, you learn from what you fail at and you get better. Uh, and it is, you know, amazing in terms of an entrepreneur in that respect. In terms of challenges, I think that the toughest challenge, and I speak to a lot of business owners um, like yourself, and I always ask, what's the biggest challenge? And every single one says staff. <laughs> um, staff or the team, just when you think you've got the perfect team, you know, someone wants to go traveling and you've got to recruit again. Uh, and in the UK right now, recruiting is really, really hard, especially since COVID. They want hybrid or they only want to work three days a week. And it's like, I'm very much um, a business owner that believes in like a team in an office, like you bounce off people, you're creative together. Um, and I also tell my team, I could work from home every day. Uh, I have quite a long journey into work. I don't have to come in, but I love coming in five days a week. I hear ideas that they're saying, and, and it's just a, a really amazing culture. Um, so the biggest challenge I'd say is staff. Um, you know, you get staff that leave and try and start on their own and take clients. And it's, it's, 
it's really difficult as a entrepreneur where you've built something up and then someone tries to take that away but that's where the brand comes in if the brand's really strong people trust you and the other challenge was probably covid like many many business owners talked about the snowball effect and that sort of stopped and it was going from like one of our best years um we're about to hit and then covid struck and literally for two weeks straight bang 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 call after call cancel 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 or re uh postponement postponed and i would say that summer of covid we lost probably half a million pounds wow. in postponed bookings so then it's like right for it, you know here the government stepped in and paid some of the wages but we didn't know that at the time so you're thinking as a business owner you know i want to protect my team because they're amazing but we also have to protect the life of the company so as entrepreneurs do you pivot um we did we started a few other businesses we did some like home packages where it was like six headphones for your family like have a silent disco over the weekend make yourself feel better um at bargain prices or a home cinema so we pivoted in different areas we opened a few other businesses just to bring cash flow in and i tell other business owners like cash flow is the most important thing i say sales first operations after like too many companies they want the nice flashy office they want a big warehouse they want 10 people in their team but they've got no sales yet so I always say get sales, 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 and that makes everything easier. If you've got the sales in and you need a new member of staff, you've got the money to invest in that new, and you can get a really good member of staff. So I'm a firm believer in like sales, sales first, operations after. It makes things so much easier. Um, but I'd say they're the significant challenges for me um, even now is, is recruitment and staff and finding talented people and um you know the struggles of covid which i think for everyone has added a few more years and a few more gray hairs to uh, entrepreneurs heads yeah you know i gotta tell you the water cooler conversations that are i'm deprived of from going into the office uh they set in quite a bit during the pandemic and i gotta admit folks this is why i created this podcast to be able to introduce you know and meet with toby and folks like like him to kind of one learn uh, and two, to meet with people, to get ideas, to bounce ideas off of each other. You know, like Toby said, I have a, I'm sure folks, that if you listen to this long enough, you've heard me say this. I've never failed a day in my life. I either succeed or I learn, right? And the reason I say that is because the way I look at failure is I've stopped doing it. No, I'm going to fail on that task, certain, but I'm actually learned something through that failure that's going to continue to propel me forward that actually makes me better. So I am not an actual failure. Sir, I failed at that task, but I'm not going to be a failure in life because I'm going to continue to learn and I'm going to continue to get better. And that's just going to continue to propel me as a business leader, as an entrepreneur to be better as for my clients, you know? Yeah. And I, it's not for me just being good about for your clients. I like it. It takes time to learn the skill. Like, you know, I have a a warehouse team that if they pack an order wrong or uh they miss something out you know back it many many years ago you take it really personally and like oh that's cost me 300 pounds as a refund but now i'm like that's the best 300 pounds training i would have spent because now they've learned from it they're not going to make that mistake again um and for the for me it's like if the team fail i'm not doing my job properly i'm not giving them the resources it's not their fault you know, everyone makes mistakes. So I really do look at that as like, I've failed or my management have failed. What can we do to make sure that member of staff is just amazing um, and can exceed in their role? If we can give them the resources, the time, the training, um, if there's a mistake, like we learn from it and, and implement that process that that mistake doesn't happen with anyone else ever again you're really learning all the time from every failure and that takes time especially like the first three four years you know you're trying to grow you take everything personally um, because it's your baby you know and it's only now that you can really like as i said i use the the analogy of the 
the failure of like 300 quid or we've had to refund someone a thousand pounds and i like my team would be annoyed and i'm like that's the best training money we've just spent because we know we've just trained the whole team over that mistake that it will never happen again i think that's super powerful now yeah i agree and the the cost of recruiting and training is is pretty astronomical from an operational perspective um but, you know I, I from one ceo actually mentioned you know um you know what happens if you train them and they leave you know and the the ceo responds and well what happens if you don't train them and they stay right and and so it, it creating the culture is very important i always say there's three types of employees uh in in, in the, the workforce there's the engaged employee right they're constantly engaged they're doing their work they're always there they're, they're going to get everything done there's the rip employee the retired in place right they kind of come they do the bare minimum they just get by but then the ones that I have difficulty with are the cave employees. They are constantly against virtually everything, right? The food sucks, the drive sucks, the hours suck, the pace, like they don't, they don't like anything. I don't mind RIP <laughs> employees because I can get you engaged. I can get you, I, I can um, become an engaged employee, but a cave employee is very difficult. And what happens is those are the ones that are training your new employees. So they tend to erode that culture. You know, and so it's it's very yeah, mindful yeah. um to build up a team, but it's also very expensive, like you said, Toby, when you lose a, a key stakeholder and then they're gone and and now you're like, well, gotta recruit and find somebody else. Yeah. And I, I I love your I'm gonna use that terminology. I have a slightly different one, which is in every business, I, I see staff on like a scale of one to ten. And I see like your one, two, threes are the people that don't want to be there. You don't want them there. They're not good at their job. Um, you can sit down, have a conversation. They'll be happier if they leave and, and do something they want to do. You've got your eights, nines, and tens, and this is what every business wants, and they are your superstars. They're in the culture. They're in it for the long term. And then you have this middle ground of, of I call them the, the five, six, sevens. And, you know, you like them. The team might be friendly with them. Um they're not good at their job. You want to get rid of them. It's a bit awkward. No one wants to have that conversation, but you have to have that conversation because if you don't, the eights, nines, and tens will leave because of the five, six, sevens. Um, so I think it's really, really important, you know, to make sure your company has eight, nines, and tens, and it takes a long time. Um, I say you have to kiss a few frogs before you find your prince. Yes, um, you do. And, um, it, it takes time to find talented people. And now, only now I'm like, hire slow, fire fast. You know, yes. if, if the management are talking about the same issue with the same member of staff, they've got to go and then hire slowly to make sure you get the right person. Otherwise, if you don't get rid of them quickly, your eights, nines and tens who work really hard and are picking up all the slack, they get frustrated, they get annoyed and then they leave because of those members of staff. So, it's a culture, it's a challenge. There's no instruction manual for a leader, for an entrepreneur. Uh, you've got to work it out. And you've got to, when you have that scenario, you learn from it. And now it's like, okay, if there's a problem. You got to deal with it because your superstars won't like it. Uh, and, and there's a risk they leave if you don't deal with the issue, you know? I agree. And there's nothing more rewarding than seeing one of your staff members, uh, propel in their professional journey, you know, seeing some of my staff members going to nursing school and helping them through that program and watching them go through the scholarship applications and things of that nature, and then becoming an RN eventually, those were very rewarding. However, with that said, there's nothing that will kill your spirit more than having to lay off a staff member uh, because you're, you weren't successful or your business, because again, as an entrepreneur, you're, you own this, right? Uh, and, and, I take pride, I'm in business development. I take pride in what I do in the healthcare industry. And, and my job is to help make a, a large sum of revenue for our institution. And so when I hear about layoffs, I take that personally as well. I'm like, man, I didn't yeah. do my job well enough uh, to maintain what we have. And then sometimes you, you begin to look around the board because to your point, Toby, you have to start to do layoffs and it, it tends to be the the high performers you, you tend to see go because it's usually those high performers are the ones that come in early too, 
right? They are, they have the, you know, they're maybe sometimes they have the blinders on because they're coming into the new, they have a lot of innovative ideas and they want to do a lot of great things. And then you have, like you mentioned, those one, twos and threes, the four, fives and sixes, they just kind of drag on that culture and it really stifles innovation and growth. Um, now, one other thing I would encourage leaders to, to do is, is don't pass the trash. And what I mean by that is if, if you're going to let someone go, one, make sure to give them a good exit interview, give them some really good insights and things of how they can continue to improve, but then don't go if, uh, get a referral from a company and, and just talk about how phenomenal they were and, and gloss over those areas of concerns. Be honest about it and also be honest about your feedback because that's the only way individuals are going to continue to grow and learn professionally. Uh, if we keep cooking cutter into this, these, you know, um, uh, basically compliments versus actual structural feedback, we're not going to learn. We're going to continue to be stagnant in our growth and innovation will stop, right? And, and I would encourage you to just provide feedback, uh, do it in a calm and nice way. Uh, these are also individuals' lives, no matter how bad they were at your workplace, right? They still have a family to go home to. So it's important to provide feedback, but also not pass the trash around. Make sure if somebody calls for a referral, you're honest about that feedback because that's another small business or entrepreneur that's going to go ahead and bring that staff member on and they will deal with the same exact headaches you did uh, because maybe you did not provide them any insight. Now, with that said, with with your valuable expertise, and you know you've been doing for some time, what advice and tips would you give listeners who are aspiring entrepreneurs or looking to start their own venture? I always say, think big, um, think big, and big things will happen. Um, you know, if you think small, small things, have a belief, um, and you have something that you you've really created that you believe in go with it and think big you know if you want to be a 10 million pound company you're more likely to get to that than if you say oh, i'm gonna you know be a 1 million pound company you know it, if you if you think small you'll do small things think big you'll do big things and and i say that to a lot of um young entrepreneurs and they're like oh i go how much how much do you want to make a year and they're like a hundred thousand and i was like but why where have you plugged plucked that figure from I was like, why don't you want to earn 500,000? Because if you think that you want to earn 500,000, you're much more likely to get closest to it. You know, you might earn 300,000. So I always say, think big, um, follow your dream. People will bring you down and like accountants and, and finance people. A lot of business owners will go to their accountant and ask for advice. And I say, why your accountant isn't an entrepreneur. Um, you know, they, they, they know their figures. They know how to plan money. Entrepreneurs should speak to other entrepreneurs. Um, you know, the reason for your channel, entrepreneurs should hear it from other entrepreneurs because we're all in the same boat. It's a lonely place. Um, you know, you can't go and ask your wife, oh, what should I do about this? Like, you know, they're not entrepreneurs and there's so many, our minds work differently. Um, we're all a bit crazy in my opinion, um, but our minds work different. And I think the best way to grow and to learn is to speak to to other fellow entrepreneurs who have been there, done it, got the metaphorical T-shirt. And that's something I do now. I listen to podcasts, um, YouTube of different entrepreneurs to see what their experiences are. Because if you can pick up little nuggets of knowledge and implement that into your business, it can just explode the growth of your business. Um, we don't know everything. I think the best ideas for me come from the team, you know, and they ask me, what do you think about it? And I'm like, well, what do you think? Or, or speak to the rest of the team. What do they think? Because the best ideas, and I tell my team every week, like any idea, however stupid you may think it is, let me know your idea because the best ideas for this business has come from the team and other entrepreneurs that have been there, done it. Um, and I, I pick up little nuggets all the time to implement and go, oh, why didn't we do that? Um, let's do it tomorrow. It's done. And you might get five, 10% growth from that little bit that you've heard and gone, I'm going to do that. That's going to change things. Um, so that's the word, not one thing, but a few things I would definitely encourage entrepreneurs to do and just follow your dream, you know, and let people put you down. My parents, 
if we've got time. Well, I thought I was bonkers buying 200 pairs of headphones. They always used to moan how many wires and cables that I had in, in my room, in the garage. And they're like, why do you need so many cables? Why do you need so many headphones? And it's like now, 10 years later, that they come in and visit me. And they're like, oh, we can see why you wanted so many cables. You know, you've got a lot of headphones to charge. <laughs> That's great. You know, and again, folks, you're, you're, um, it is a lonely ride in you know, entrepreneurship. And so get out there and network with folks, talk with people, feel comfortable sharing your mental health state as well. Cause I don't think you will be surprised about how many people are actually going through similar things throughout life, whether they're an entrepreneur or a executive or, or, you know, doesn't matter. Everybody starts somewhere. In fact, uh, Red Hot Cheetos, right. With at Frito Lay was created by one of their janitors, you know, and so it's important to remember. It's a tough yeah, and entrepreneurship happens even in the corporate setting. So, so go ahead and go ahead and look out now, Toby. For the folks that are interested, the audience that want to learn more about you, and maybe maybe they're out in the UK and they're interested in your service, how can they contact you? What is your webpage, and then maybe how can they find you on social media? Webpage, social media, search at the Silent Disco Company. You'll see all of our brands. Um, if you want to see sort of my journey and different stuff that we do. With property and uh, buying businesses um i can also be found out at the eventrepreneur at the eventrepreneur um get in touch with us we do stuff in the us we do stuff in dubai all over so uh yeah if you're interested check out the channel check out our social media and uh we'll be glad to uh, have you on the ride I love it. And folks, if you forget all of that information, this is a great time to plug the newsletter, the Shades of Entrepreneurship newsletter that you can subscribe to by visiting the shades of e.com. You can also follow us on the social sites. We have Facebook, TikTok, Instagram, and LinkedIn at the Shades of E. And you can watch this episode streaming on YouTube at the Shades of E as well. Lastly, if you wouldn't so mind do so, become one of the patrons of the Shades of Entrepreneurship for as little as $5 a month. You can help support the podcast, which again, brings you all these phenomenal guests, great insights, and you can get a free copy of my book, The Starting Line, which is a basically a quick synopsis of how do you start a business here within the Oregon area. It also provides you with a map, my man, mind mapping exercise that's actually put on by IDEO. So thank you for the IDEO team for allowing me to use that. Again, there is actually no value in my book. It's just a lot of my thoughts. So, uh, but Hey, I do appreciate uh, all your support. Uh, Toby, again, thank you so much for joining us. Is there any last words you'd like to say to the guests or the like to say to the audience? Thank you for watching. Follow us. Um, watch our journey, day in the life of, of an entrepreneur. And thank you uh, for having me on the uh, channel. Really appreciate your time. No, I appreciate it. In fact, I will be out in Greece uh, here in the next month at uh, some time. So if you service Greece, let me know. Maybe I'll make you jump on a boat and head over to Crete, the island of Crete, and drop off <laughs> one of these little silent things. All right, folks, again, thank you again so much for listening to the Shades of Entrepreneurship. Please follow us at the Shades of E. Thank you, and have a great night.